welcome to Johannesburg. Welcome to Wits University for this uh, roundtable meeting of the African Journalism Educators Network. Um, we uh, really look forward to a days of discussion. My name is Franz Kruger. Um, I hope to meet all of you properly as the day goes on. Um, but as I say, you're all very, very welcome. I think there are a number of Johannesburg colleagues that are still going to join us. Um, isn't it always the isn't it funny that it's always the locals that are late? Um, but anyway, um, so um, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Lynn Morris to um, say a few words of welcome. Um, we're very glad that you could join us here um, for this for this meeting. Um, Professor Morris is is the DVC in charge of research and innovation at. The university. Uh, she's um, a vaccinologist, so from a completely different field, an A-rated scientist who's been involved in the South African response, prominently involved in the South African response, both to the HIV um, crisis as well as more recently the COVID crisis. So uh, it's good of you to cross the great divide and come and talk to us humanities types. Yes, please do. Thanks. So yes, good morning, everybody. And actually, firstly, welcome to South Africa to those of you who have traveled far. I'm actually really impressed you managed to all navigate, you know, this, uh, yeah, this new world um, and, uh, and chose to come because I think also one of the things we have to fight against is, uh, you know, doing everything online because I think we do miss something when we, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't get, well, it's much better to get together physically. I think it's a much richer experience. So, so welcome all to South Africa and, and welcome to WITS. Um, so WITS, uh, um, I don't know if you all know, but it's just celebrated 100 years. Um, we just had our big party, in fact, uh, last weekend or weekend before last um, to, uh, you know, to celebrate 100 years of excellence and 100 years of surviving many things. You know, uh, universities are really resilient organizations um, and they have, you know, survived a lot of <clears throat> a lot of trouble and trauma and actually you know um due, due to due to one of the most important things and that's academic freedom and that's because of the freedom that people can um you know really speak their uh, speak truth to power as they say um and that's why universities are safe spaces and particularly in your sort of area you know in, in journalism um and um for those of you that follow you know the south african uh, political scene, you'll know that uh, the journalists in this country have really, um, you know, been uh, really at the forefront of fighting the high levels of corruption that we've been experiencing. And so really want to recognize them. So I'm here um, really also representing our Vice Chancellor, Professor Zeblan Vilakazi, um, who, uh, who's um, actually in the US at the moment, um, but would certainly also extend a warm welcome to you all. Um, and I also want to welcome, I think there are some people online, so welcome to those of you online. But, um, but I, I see that, uh, you know, you're all from, in fact, I've counted the number of countries, 12 different countries in Africa. Um, so it's really, this is really a very impressive gathering. So well done to, you know, to France and Dinesh for, you know, for, for pulling this, this group together. Um, and uh, so I, uh, you know, this, this meeting really does come um, at a very important time for journalism um, because it's experienced significant disruptions around the world, um, particularly things like the rise of the internet and platforms like Google, Facebook, and others. While well, they've opened many doors, but they've also hurt the legacy of media organizations um, that have been providing, you know, um, the world's journalism for decades. As audiences move to, sa to satisfying their information needs, online newspaper circulations have dropped and advertising money has moved into, the, into uh, the pockets of internet giants and media houses have closed uh, or cut jobs. And at the same time, these platforms have allowed misinformation to flourish and that's uh, you know, um, poisoned our system. And, and in fact, as um, Franz mentioned, you know, I'm a vaccinologist and I think we saw the really damaging effect that this had on, on the vaccination program and highlighted how dangerous some of these issues really are. Um, and, you know, these anti-vaccination groups 
managed to persuade others to refuse a simple medical intervention that, that unequivocally has demonstrated how, how it saves lives. But there are many other damage, uh, examples of the damage um, that misinformation has, has caused. So credible journalism has perhaps never been uh, more important than now. So, uh, you know, in addition to these, the, these many challenges, um, there also comes on top of the legacy of disadvantage that has harmed journalism and harmed audiences and citizens on the continent um, and, and then hurt democracy itself. A lack of media density and large inequalities between the information rich and the information poor countries have long marked African media landscapes. At the same time, journalists in many countries have had to work under conditions of poor media freedom and with precarious working conditions. So to all of you as African educators, you have a really important role to play uh, in meeting these challenges and seeking to understand the specific ways in which media landscapes are changing on the continent and how journalism schools need to change in response. And this topic that you're going to be discussing from the classroom to the African newsroom and it's, uh, and it's uh, invites consideration of the relationship between these two. Um, and it, it can't be business as usual um, if, if, if jobs for graduates are scarce or precarious. And it's also critical for these questions to be considered from a specifically African and Global South perspective. Too often Global North scholarship simply assumes a universalism. Uh, their experiences are the norm and it can be applied simply to everybody else. Evidence to the contrary is simply ignored. The round table, this roundtable marks an important initiative for African scholars and teachers to compare notes and develop an agenda for teaching, research and action that fits our circumstances. So I really do want to uh, thank the, the sponsors of this event, uh, Fojo Media Institute and the Swedish Government's Development Agency or, or CEDA for partnering and to support this event. And I think, you know, these, these networks of, of people coming together is really, really very crucial um, because that's how you have a collective voice. That's how you network. That's how you share experiences and resources. And so these kinds of networks, and I see it's sort of an informal network. And so I'd really encourage you to think about actually trying to formalize that to really develop a strong, a strong network uh, that has real advocacy and lobbying power. And in fact, um, I'm actually going to Ghana on Sunday um, to, some of you may know about Arua, the African Research Universities Alliance. Um, some of you may be part of Arua. It's a network of 16 research intensive universities on the African continent. Um, and they establish centers of excellence around the African continent. We have two here at WITS. Um, and the plan is to, you know, to, um, to establish more of these um, centers. And I'd really like to push this group to think about establishing um, a center of excellence for journalism that really builds on what you already have. I think you're in a strong position you know, to, to, to make a good case for it and to, and to lobby for it. Because I do think the power comes from when you all collaborate and you all work together and, and, and share experiences. Because um, journalism is under threat, um, and, but clearly you're all very committed and passionate about it and particularly about mentoring and training the next generation. You know, that's really a key, a key aspect uh, of the centers of excellence. It's about mentoring and, and training. Um, so with that, I'd like to wish you a wonderful day ahead. It looks like a fabulous program. Unfortunately, I won't be able to stay, um, but I will um, hear back from Dinesh and from France about how it went. And really just to thank also Dinesh and France for their leadership in this area and for pulling together, um, you know, these, these, these um, networks and workshops to discuss really critical issues uh, that, affect, uh, that affect all of you. All right, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Lynn, and uh, yeah, thanks for those, um, those scene-setting welcoming words. Um, I think we're all as bits pleased that we were able to um, pull together this kind of event. Um, so I think we should first go around the table and introduce ourselves. I mean, you'll see firstly that you will that um, there are labels. Why don't you just put your names on a label and stick it to yourself? Um, but let's also just go around the table and uh, say who we are briefly and where we're from. 
uh, we're not such a big group that we that we can't do that. Um, let's start. Um, well, I'll, I've already introduced myself, Franz Kruger from from Vitz. Let's go around this way. Um, we're just introducing ourselves. Oh, hello, uh, colleagues. Uh, my name is Musa Ivong uh, with the University of Cape Town. I'm an associate professor there. I teach media studies in general, political communication, research methods, and political journalism, that's political communication, etc. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Superior. Good morning, colleagues. I'm Stuart Mohammed from the University of Washington. I'm the lecturer there. I teach journalism and public relations. Um, can I just ask you to turn on your mic when you talk for the benefit of, of the online? I see Zelalem is there from Ethiopia. Um, perhaps I, I think others will join in, but just turn on your mic on your mic. We'll we'll do it from now. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Christine Achan Mitu from the University of Mauritius, where I'm a senior lecturer in media and communications. So we've researched interest in journalism, media, freedom, access to information, gender equality, and language policy as well. Good morning, everybody. My name is Nancy Booker uh, from the Aga Khan University's uh, Graduate School of Media and Communications in Nairobi. I'm currently the interim dean, and I'm also an associate professor at the school. I teach uh, in journalism, um, and um, I have a keen interest in media leadership and innovation. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Chiumbu. I'm associate professor at the University of Johannesburg, and I teach media studies. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Bazo Hamusokwe. I'm from the University of Zambia. I teach media studies. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is John Semakula. I'm from Uganda Christian University in Mukono. Uh, I deliver greetings from Professor Monica Chibeta. I am a newsroom journalist, as well as a lecturer at Uganda Christian University. I uh, left the newsroom in 2019, although I still contribute articles to different platforms uh, outside Uganda and within Uganda. Um, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. My name is Theodora Dami Ajintete, and I'm a lecturer at the University of Ghana and a research associate at uh, Rhodes University here in South Africa. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Enoch Sitole. I work here, I teach journalism. Good morning, I'm Modestus Fosu from the Ghana Institute of Journalism, Accra. Um, my interest is in media ethics and communication ethics. And I'm also interested in indigenous language broadcasting and that's what I've been researching, thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Alan Finley. I work for Wits Center for Journalism and edit State of the Newsroom Report. And apologies, I was a little late. Good morning, I'm Margaret Duco. I'm from the School of Journalism and Communication, University of Rwanda. I teach uh, journalism and media studies, um, data journalism and uh, digital journalism. My research interests are in um, 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 environmental journalism and communication and aspects of social justice. I am currently associate professor. Good morning, everyone. I'm Katya Mangi. I'm from <coughs> Mozambique Media Lab. I'm teacher of journalism and a specialist in investigative journalism. <coughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Andrew Ansongo from the East African University in Rwanda, Kigali. I'm the head of department, Department of Mass Communication. I primarily teach uh, writing for the media, broadcast, press, and uh, other related platforms. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Jessica Antoiras. I am a communication specialist. I'm here representing the Namibia Media Trust. I'm also a research um, associate at IPPR and a junior investigative journalist at the Namibia newspaper. Morning, I'm Pilar Di Sutosa and I'm from the VIT Center for Journalism um, and I coordinate and teach in the Career Entry Program. Morning everyone, um, my name is Dinesh Balia, I'm the Acting Director of the VIT Center for Journalism and I last saw, I should say this, last saw Basil <laughs> in Los Angeles in 2018, 19 and Theodora in Sweden uh, at the beginning of the year. So it's lovely to see everyone, welcome. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jean Mujati. I'm a program coordinator with Foyo Media Institute. Um, been busy coordinating all of you to be here today. It's so good to finally be holding this meeting and uh, looking forward to a great day ahead. Thank you. Thanks. And once again, welcome to all. Can we just see who's online? If there are people there who we can ask to introduce themselves? We lost Zalalem, it looks like. Oh no, there's a whole bunch. Um, can we can we just briefly hear from you um, where you're from? Um, starting with Anthea, if I can ask the technical team just to turn on the on the on the microphones. Of course, this, this is the moment that people have gone to get tea. <laughs> As we all do on Zoom, right? I really don't want to embarrass anybody. Um, um, yeah, Franz, if you can hear me. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Anthea, we can, <laughs> yes. Okay, I'm Anthea Garman from the School of Journalism and Media Studies at Rhodes University. And um, I'm sorry I'm not with you uh, physically today, but it's really lovely to be able to participate in this conversation with so many of you. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, Bongi? Bongi where? Good morning, Franz, can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'll be joining soon in person. Um, so I'm just running a bit late, but I am Bongi Wei Tutu. I'm with the VIT Center for Journalism. <laughs> Um, project coordinator for the Africa China reporting project and uh, we've really been looking at opportunities to work with um, journalism students so thank you so much. Cool. Elva? Elva and Ziza? Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Elva and Ziza and I'm currently working with uh, uh, NLA University College and working as a um, uh, managing editor of Afro Media Network. Thank you so much for allowing me to be in the meeting online. Nice to hear your voice again, Elva. Thank you. We're from Christian Sant. Guy. Hi, everyone. I'm Guy Berger. I was recently with UNESCO promoting journalism and education. And um, before that, I was with the Road School of Journalism at um, Makanda in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. So um, very nice to be here. Congratulations, everyone. And I hope um, I can attend uh, quite a lot of the event, but sometimes I'll have to go out. And um, I'm very pleased to say that um, a colleague in, in the crime of promotion journalism, Sandra, will be speaking uh, with you uh, sometime this afternoon, giving out some books that we hope will be useful to journalism teachers about uh, teaching media policy in Africa. Thanks, Brad. Great, thanks, Guy. <clears throat> uh, Mama Ponya? Mama Ponya, what's I? Third from the bottom there. Hi, yeah. everyone. Yes, hi. Hi, my name is Mama Ponya. I'm a journalism lecturer at Frey College. So I teach uh, um, an entry level journalism course for community media and activists. Okay, good to meet you. Um, 
Monin Zamen. Monin Zamen Munir. Second from the bottom there. We'll see whether they can come back. Advocate Sulo, a familiar name. Robin? Can you hear me, Franz? Yes, indeed. Uh, morning, everybody. My name is Robin Sula. Uh, I've spent several decades in academia as a journalism educator. I'm now an independent trainer and I run an organization called Radiocracy. Good to be here, France, and nice meeting people from across the continent. Great, welcome. Okay, so um, welcome to everyone. I'm sure that there will be um, people coming in and possibly people going out um, from time to time, but at least we have a sense of who's here. Um, and it really is a great, a great group to have. Uh, I just wanted to, before we get into the first um, discussion, just say one or two things about the day. I mean, you'll see the program is, is structured rather differently to what most academic uh, events are. It's not a series of papers that are being delivered. It's a series of conversations. Um, I mean, from tomorrow onwards, you'll have your fill, I think, at SACOM of papers being de de delivered. And of course, there is enormous value um, in that. Um, but I think for today, I think let's keep it informal. Um, most of the, the, the discussions are fairly short, I mean, hour-long sessions, and um, uh, as I say, structured rather informally. And of course, the opportunity is to meet each other, right? We've le left good time, you know, substantial time for over coffee and, and lunches and so on, to, for people to chat, um, and let's make use of that opportunity as best we can. Um, this afternoon, at the end of the day, I think we need to have a discussion about this network, right? I mean, Professor Morris Lynn was encouraging us to be more formal. Um, that's one of the things that we need to discuss. Um, my own um, uh, instinct is to say, let's not rush into creating big structures, but let's talk about it this afternoon. But let's also use the day as we engage with each other around some of these issues to think about that, right? Um, obviously, we are a small portion of the of the of the potential audience or the potential grouping of journalism schools on the continent, um, and we would like to grow that. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, it's uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I've been in a meeting with so many countries, so many journalism schools um, represented. So um, let's think about during the course of the day. Two um, uh, practical things that I want to signal. Um, you'll see that on the program, we will break for lunch at half past 12, I hope. But we will first, before we actually go and eat, we will first give um, people a chance to talk about particular projects that they're involved in. I've lined up a couple that I'm aware of. Um, um, uh, but if there is anyone else who wants to just spend a few minutes talking about a research project or a coordination project or something um, at that moment, just grab me over tea or at some point, um, whether you're online or whether you're, whether you're here. Um, uh, that was the one thing. The other thing is that I've, um, we've, we've asked, well, you've done the register, right? That's gone around um, just with an indication of um, if, if you're not yet on the newsletter list, please just indicate that um, we have restarted that newsletter. I'm also going to pass around a list and I'm going to ask people to indicate the textbooks that you're currently using um, in terms of teaching journalism. I mean, I think it will be really interesting to get a sense of what we're all currently using because in my sense is that there is a real dearth, um, particularly of African practical books. I was really struck going around the table how we shift easily between questions of research and questions of teaching, questions of engagement with communications as a discipline as, and, and journalism and various other related fields. Um, the, in, the, the interest today, I think, is about the connection of 
of, of how we integrate as scholars, as, 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 you, as academics, as university, and other um, um, teachers of various kinds with the practical world of journalism. And to do that properly, I think we need sometimes to disaggregate these different things. Where does scholarship start and end? Where does research start and end? How does it interface with the teaching? How does it interface with the practical world? Because I think sometimes we slip, you know, as I say, a little bit too easily between these things as if they're as if they're the same thing and they're not at all. Um, so yeah, so let me know if you've got projects to talk to, um, and we'll do a list of textbooks. In fact, Kimmy, when you have, I'll I'll get somebody's attention and we'll we'll do a little list and and get it circulated. Um, in terms of practical things, if if you've got any issues, of course, talk to me or talk to Jean, um, and we'll try and sort things out as quickly as we can. Having said those things, can I ask um, Katya and uh, Sipiwe to sit here for the opening for the for the first panel? I'm not quite sure whether Dapu has joined us. I don't see him on the participants list online. He was traveling, I know. He was due to join us, um, but not quite sure what happened. Is it okay there? Brilliant. So the opening panel is really um, focused on the question of the day. And we formulated it as from the classroom to the African newsroom. And as I say, it's about trying to situate ourselves in African media landscapes in the information ecosystems that we inhabit, um, bridging that gap. I mean, academics are sometimes accused of being aloof, of being of disappearing into their ivory towers, um, and I think that's something that we, as journalism teachers, really can't afford to do. Um, so, in a sense, that's the core topic, and it's also the core um, theme of this opening panel. Um, what is it that we can do better? What is it that we can do uh, to integrate ourselves into, into the media landscapes, information ecosystems, as I, as I like to say, um, that we serve and that we're part of? So I'm very pleased. I mean, they've already introduced themselves, but I'm very pleased that uh, you could join us. Uh, Sapir Mohammed from the University of Eswatini. Um, and Katya, Ma Katya Mangwe from Media Lab in Mozambique. Uh, Dampu is also on the list, but not present, I think. Um, we're making some attempts here to contact him. Maybe he'll come in a little bit later. Um, what is so interesting about this group, particularly if Dampu does join us, is that we have somebody involved in academic teaching, somebody involved in should we say NGO teaching, an NGO that is doing media development, um, media training, which is a common feature of many of our environments, many of our societies. Here we have the IAJ, and there are um, similar organizations in many country, uh, countries, and then a publisher, Premium Times, who is also, has also set up a teaching arm. I've asked the panelists just to open with a few um, opening remarks, and then let's open the discussion. And um, I hope we can have a lively and active discussion. But can I ask, start with you, Katya? Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I would like to do, first of all, the overview of journalists in Mozambique. But uh, my English is very weak. <laughs> I will Sorry, apologize. Yes. Sorry? Sorry. OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, I said that I would like to begin to make an overview of journalism in Mozambique. First of all, I will talk about the universities. In Mozambique, we have only four public universities teaching journalism. And uh, these universities are very concentrated in the capital of the country, Maputo. Uh, namely, uh, Eduardo Mondlane University, Unilurio, uh, Unimaputo, and the higher school journalism, but three of them are in Maputo. 
Only one is in Zambezia, the center of the country. Uh, this concentration of the university in the capital is very problem for Mozambique because the people living in urban areas have most opportunity to have or to learn journalism, but the rural people have not the same opportunity. We have two types of journalists, urban journalists and urban journalists. When you talk about the access are very different from these groups and the quality too is very different from this group. Uh, the rural students have not opportunity to go to university. They people work in the community radios, but is creative people, uh, curious people, but have not training from journalists. And uh, in the Mozambique, we have a systems didn't guarantee safe of journalists. The African countries I market, barriers, terrorism, persecution of journalists. In Mozambique, for example, the journalists are murdered, the security issue is worrying. It's prob probably important to include discussions of safety, safety of journalist classes and the situation more critical when it comes about investigative journalism. Uh, the salaries, the salaries is very bad among the worst in country and community works, community journalists works as volunteer, have not money. The quality of this work are very bad, but these people have motivation to do a journalism in community radio. But the question from our discussion today is how does journalist education related to the reality of practical journalist work it's involving in Africa? In my ideas, the big problem of our journalists, our journalists is our curricula. Our curricula are very theoretical. We have not opportunity to do practical in university. In Mozambique, for example, we have four years to teach journalism. The first year, 100% uh, concentrated, the theoretical, second year, two, third year, two, only 40 years we have opportunity to do practical. The percent is 18% for theoretical, 30 for practical. How these people can have a good disappear in the newsroom, is possible? I think no. We response capacity to curricula, but our curricula are no based of the reality of African countries. In Mozambique, for example, we use the different models, Brazilian models, uh, England models, uh, Portugal models, but the reality are very diff different with our country. The teacher, teaching for course and theoretical is ensure living aside journalists practice. The teacher programs doesn't no follow dynamics of Mozambique. Now, for example, we have the bad situation from journalists, terrorism. We have change climate. We have digital media, but curricula are supported in traditional media. The people is not prepared to, uh, how can I say, accompany it to digital media. <coughs> the students don't, don't have access to re reality of newsroom. Stay 100% of time in the university. We Media Lab received more people. We working with practical journalists. We have hand, we, we are hand right of the universities. Our focus is practical. But when the students' degree in journalism comes from Media Lab, they didn't know to do a lead, lead to make a notice. It's very, very worrying for us. And uh, another situation could be preoccupation for from Mozambican people is the emergence of a situation with professional without qualification to teach journalists. 
we have not the opportunity to have good teachers in our country. More people take journalism like, uh, when I say brincadeira, joining, don't take it serious. But it's not problem of the people, it's the problem of the structure of our country. <laughs> and what Media Lab contribution do to journalism? We have a slogan. Our slogan is journalism learning by doing. We talk about the join of theoretical and the practical journalism. We, we take the intern think outside the box. When I talk the box, I'm talk the mind. To think outside the box is to focus your mind to resolve the problem of the people. Focus in social program, problem of our country. We recruit journalism from the, all the country, especially center and north regions, because those people have not opportunity to come from the capital to have training in journalism. Until now, uh, Media Lab is on the organization to training journalists in investigative area, but it's very difficult to teach investigative area in Mozambique. I think that in all the countries of Africa is the same situation. Uh, we involve a great number of women uh, in training the program. 6% of our students are women. And we need to improve the presence of the women in the newsroom because we have uh, elitely women in newsroom. The humans have more people of in newsroom. Uh, we, we, we work with inclusive media. We have NTV, include people with uh, various disabilities, and we improve these people to have more capacity to do a journalism. We try to combine the theoretical and the journalist practice. And I, need, uh, I know that uh, another problem of the journalism in our country is networking. We have no network to protect the journalists. I think that there is any opportunity to discuss about this necessity of to have a network. Um, what is, what does it mean to choose, to teach journalism for possibility for job market? Teach of journalism in our country is challenge task, especially in context that political power is very strong. The education systems is very limited. We transmit knowledge about things uh, like freedom of press, but sometimes it's utopia. It's very utopia. Uh, Prof, I think that I will stop here. We will continue to discuss another point. Sure. We do that. Good night. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, for us in Swaziland, probably maybe taking from what Katia was saying, it, it would be helpful to have an overview, a little bit of journalism teaching in the country. Um, my university, the University of Eswatini, the Department of Journalism and Mass Communication, is probably the oldest institution that's teaching journalism since the 1990s. Um, the university is a 40 year old institution, so it's still relatively new as well. We, the program began as a communication program within the English department in the 1990s and then evolved into a diploma, a three year diploma program uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, by 2010, the university started implementing the current BA degree program that we have now, which is, um, which is an upgrade from the diploma that was phased out. Uh, around the same time, 2011, a new institution was established in the country, the Limco Queen University of Creative Technology, and it's the only other institution that offers journalism training within the country at um, college or university level. Within the program that we are offering, we have uh, three specializations, journalism, advertising and public relations and broadcasting. And uh, we've observed as we were implementing this program over the years, 
how much many of our students are sort of fo focusing a lot more on advertising and PR specialization. Uh, they are shying away from journalism. Mm -hmm. Since the program began in 2010, uh, I think this is the second group of journalism, print journalism specializing students that we have. Over the years, they've sort of focused either specialized in PR and advertising or in broadcasting. We've been trying to motivate them to join the journalism program, and we've made some initiatives to make that possible. So the specialization is a third year, and it's, it's up to the student, but as a department, we are trying to see whether we can do something to make sure that we have a larger pool of students in the, in the print specialization. Uh, we've, we've sort of uh, worked on several initiatives to also try and get um, our program to be as, to enhance our program over the years. One of those initiatives was initiating a part-time program for targeting students who graduated from the phased out diploma program. And uh, basically, we, were, we did a research within the media institutions and the need for training was quite emphasized by the practicing journalists, mainly upgrading their skills, those who had the diploma, but we still had a, a pool of journalists who were mainly, who, who mainly developed through on the job training, who were high school leavers and joined the, the newsroom from there. So we haven't yet implemented the part-time program because there were some challenges along the way, one of which was resource constraints. We needed to upgrade our equipment within the department, mainly broadcast equipment, as well as uh, television broadcasting equipment to try and provide a more competitive program that the practicing journalists could could appreciate when they join, when they enrolled. And um, we were also grappling with how to implement the practical component of that program within a part-time program because we were considering the issues of uh, students coming in whilst continuing with their jobs. But also when we went through the COVID phase and the university adopted um, blended learning approach, we started to see that there were possibilities there, but we haven't finalized yet how we're going to proceed with, with the part-time program. And um, the other initiative that we, we, we have worked on is our campus radio station, the communications regulator, Eswatini Communications Commission, granted as a license in 2019. And uh, we initially faced some challenges in terms of equipment, transmission equipment, uh, we resourced for that. So currently we've had a year of uh, consistent broadcasting that is run by the students uh, who are volunteers at the station. Um, and we, in our next steps for the campus radio station, we're looking at involving more youth within the neighboring community. Mm -hmm. We have some volunteers from there, but we want to strengthen that. We hope that we, if we expose them to the broadcasting, especially the equipment and train them on some of the um, skills of broadcasting, like radio production, presenting, etc., we'll be able to, to get to expose them to, to media and also get them to be more interested. We are at the same time seeking technical and financial support for streaming the students' uh, content online, because at the moment we are only reaching the campus, the main campus, which is what you're saying, we are not reaching Babane and Biengo campuses. Um, more recently, we started um, reviewing our degree program as a department and um, we were trying to be responsive to the needs of students, industry, and trends within the journalism sector. I think what Katya mentioned, for example, about some of the challenges that newsrooms have 
with some university graduates. We've also experienced from uh, consultations we've had with some editors about the readiness of our graduates when they get to the newsroom. But we, whilst at the same time, we have observed that sometimes newsrooms are just one journalist to hit the ground running. We were still trying to continue conversations with them in terms of how we can get the students to be uh, ready to, to practice journalism as soon as they get to the newsroom. For now, I guess our program is probably more geared or more in favor of the broadcasting component because of the campus radio st station, the students are able to practice their broadcasting skills in radio. Probably even in the, the news writing, the skill seems to be there in terms of radio news. But when it comes to print journalism, they, they seem to struggle. We have had a few initiatives over the years where we've had students uh, establish campus news, newspapers, a campus newsletter, but we failed to ensure in sustainability of those programs over the years. And we are trying to see how we can work around that because the skills that seem to have a gap still need to be uh, emphasized. In terms of the subjects that we're about today, some of the questions that uh, I, want, I wanted to share are based on what we've been also thinking about as a department with our ongoing program review, and also some of the, the issues that are related to, to, talk, to what we're talking about. The first one is who should be taught journalism? For us, we've identified both our existing and future full-time students because the program is still quite popular uh, amongst young people within uh, whenever they apply for programs within the university. But we still want to keep our enrollment figures low. Some of the challenges have to do with equipment. Our, our lab, what then translates to a sort of mini newsroom for the radio volunteers accommodates about 25 students, but our enrollment figures for the past three, four years have been at about 40, 50. So the capacity is not enough for us to, um, to expand the program much further than the capacity that we have. Of course, our management is adamant about increasing enrollment figures. And then also the main challenge is that our media industry is small. We have four, um, main national institutions, two print newspapers, and then a radio and a television station that are state owned. Those are the main media in instruments that we have, but we have other independent um, uh, news establishments like online newspapers, a private television station, and we also have a, a community radio station, which is Christian focused. So besides the, the voice of the church, we are the only other holder of a community broadcasting license in the country. Uh, so in terms of the market, it's quite small and it's also probably part of the reason why we, we are really, we, we decided to hold the part-time program, looking also at the competition that is there that Limco Queen Creative University is uh, producing quite a large number of journalism students, and yet the market may not be able to absorb them. Uh, and then we have practicing journalists, I guess, with the part-time program. That's what we were thinking of in terms of upskilling them. Um, and then as well as mature journalists, some who've been in the field for a while, those ones possibly in the future, the department can look into mounting and postgraduate program. The other issue would be the skills that future journalists should have. For us, we were looking at a variety and some of it have touched upon like the practical skills. And then the need for multimedia skills remains uh, prevalent. Um, we lately, when we were looking at the review, some colleagues in the department were looking at whether we need our journalism students to be exposed to coding skills as well, looking at whether 
there is need for them to be exposed to newer uh, issues like or concepts like artificial intelligence, machine learning. But the key question for under-resourced institutions like ours is probably what implications that may have on infrastructure. And um, similarly, when we're looking at newer developments like entrepreneurial journalism, we have a, a, a mass media entrepreneurship course that we are teaching currently. But then when we're looking at assisting journalists establish you know, online startups, et cetera, we may need to be looking at business skills. We may need to, look in, to be looking at access to capital. Um, how do we facilitate that as a department? Those are some of the things we were looking at. And also the implications on upgrading of teacher skills and retraining in areas that are not necessarily journalism related. We were also looking at things like soft skills, but again, we had questions there about how, how do we teach journalists to be able to adapt to change currently, for example, when we're looking at how COVID seemed to surprise us and making sure that since we may have other sudden crises, how do journalists adapt to reporting on those environments. The recent unrest that Swaziland went through, for example, uh, last year, um, we noticed in the reporting that was there that there may be need for our journalists to be exposed to things like conflict reporting that we are not part of our curriculum currently. And you could see that they, they were really struggling to, to report in a way that would be useful to, 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 to readers in terms of understanding what issues those were. So those, the issue of soft skills, we also were not sure whether these are even taught skills. Uh, is it something that we can be able to be responsive to as a department? Uh, the third question was, what content should they know? I think the existing knowledge in terms of the curriculum that we have may cover some of this, but probably it needs looking into as well, look, uh, in terms of some of the sub themes of what we will be discussing today. And then what, what Finlay described as specialist knowledge, as I mentioned before, things like COVID, climate change, um, is there something we can do to um, help improve our curriculum. Currently, our program doesn't have any health journalism uh, incorporated within that, for instance. And then lastly, the expectation, expectations of society from journalists today, what does society expect from journalists? Within Eswatini, the digital disruption and social media seeming to overtake traditional media has, has sort of destabilize journalism's credibility. The Swazi public is questioning whether journalists are a necessity because they are seeing social media break stories all the time, particularly what in the past seemed to be sensitive stories around politics, around royalty. So how, what can we do probably as a department to ensure that we can assist so that journalism's credibility can be restored. And then probably the issue of information inequalities uh, for Swazi media, the, as Katya highlighted, we are experiencing the same. The focus seems to be reporting on urban issues and the journalists themselves are urban based. Some of it is based on resources. The newsrooms are under resourced. So transport to far flung areas is not readily available. So um, the question remains that we have a large segment of large segment of the population who are not in the news agenda. What role can community or civic journalism play there? And if community media can be an answer, where, what about our context where community radio or community television is not legalized yet? We have a broadcasting bill that's been you know, going in and out of parliament for some years. Currently it's passed both houses of parliament, but it's awaiting royal consent. 
that can take you know an even extended period of time and yet um, our citizens are being left out of the picture lastly probably we looked at funding and partnerships because we always have some thoughts around that as a department we are looking at maybe what we can do for the project which is our focus the campus radio station for now our next step is to see what we can do in terms of advertising and sponsorship to mobilize resources for the station in terms of partnership we we'll plan to prioritize industry's involvement in our program we currently have journalists who teach some of our practicing journalists who teach some of our print specialization courses on a part-time basis but we see that there's probably need for more collaboration with journalists and editors um, for example looking at inviting them for guest lectures and um, today's meeting i guess is raising the pertinent question of how we can collaborate with other um, journalism departments locally and regionally for exchange of ideas and best practices and lastly we are exploring how best to provide support to professional bodies in the country our national journalism association which is the swazi national association of journalists has been struggling for some years now what can we do as a department to strengthen it and we no longer have MISA within the country and this is a deeply felt gap within the, the swazi media sector so how can we assist these bodies to be strengthened and sustained for the benefit of journalism students and the industry as a whole? That is all. I hope it's not too much of a mouthful. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Mbeki. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mbeki. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you've both raised um, difficult and fascinating questions. I was particularly struck by the question, are journalists necessary? <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a bit of a challenge to all of us, isn't it? Um, I'd like to invite everyone into the discussion. Um, yeah, many questions have been asked. Questions around um, different potential student groups, different skills um, that may or may, may not be necessary. Um, I was reading an article actually early this morning from somebody from Colombia, I think, talking about the Swiss army knife approach to skill, journalism skills. You want to teach journalism graduates everything so that they can use it, whatever the circumstances, from coding to language to writing leads to audio to television editing. And the argument was actually we can't and actually we should be focusing on critical skills. But what would those be? What are the core skills that we're trying to teach? Um, I was also interested in your, you know, you were talking about reaching out to, to media houses and getting from them, um, you know, input. And we tend to go to the established newsrooms, don't we? And yet so many of our graduates go into communications, they go into informal settings, they go into community media sometimes, all sorts of other places. And I'm not sure we always capture exactly what those people need. Um, who wants to kick us off? Any of these, yes, um, uh, Sarah. Uh, I thank you so much for very interesting uh, discussions. So I want to take off from, you know, the last point about a journalist needed. <laughs> um, I think the question for me is, what do journalists bring that is different from the other players that are also in the information sharing business. Because even when we speak to our students, the ones we are training, the journalists today, they don't even read news. They read Twitter. They get their news on Twitter, on social media. And I think the majority of people, and I think you, you rightly said that a lot of um, uh, news and information is shared um, in social media. They break the news. And people tend to trust those sources more than um, uh, you know, the legacy uh, journalism. So I think the question we need to ask ourselves is there are so many players that are now part of the media ecosystem or the journalism ecosystem. 
uh, outside players <laughs> and they are playing critical roles. So what does journalism mean in, in this kind of environment? And, and what do they offer that is different? Um, so I think during COVID, um, we saw that a lot of trust in, in legacy journalism was coming back um, because the media became the source of, you know, um, what was considered credible information, but it was during a, you know, a crisis. But outside crises, what is the role of the media or of journalism in today's and going forward? Um, so I think it's a very good question that we need to set it apart, that journalists do something extra uh, that is not being done elsewhere, and they still have a critical role to play. Uh, so that's the first point. Then the second point is, this is just a question to, to people in the room. Uh, I think uh, the issue of artificial intelligence and digital uh, technology issue was brought up in the discussion again. Um, I just want to know how many universities here or colleges are actually teaching um, students in data journalism or artificial intelligence, issues around artificial intelligence and the use of data, like practically. I just want to get an idea. Thanks. Um, if you can, if you can permit me, I want to start from where you stopped. First of all, let me thank the earlier uh, presenters. Thank you very much. When you are talking, I was uh, assimilating because there are so many um, commonalities that we have, and most of the challenges we face down in Rwanda are similar to some maybe uh, apart from my sister Nancy, because their institution is uh, pretty much better off uh, than uh, us down there. But when you are talking about the inequalities between the urban um, the students, look recruits and uh, rural, uh, you know, there's a lot of commonalities. We get students that have never even been exposed to a cell phone, a smartphone, uh, we get students that have never been exposed to media content, as, as we know, like a newspaper, but then they all come to study together with those ones that are quite advanced. So we learn a lot from each other. And some of the interventions, like a drawing on the working journalists to come and uh, you know, help supplement and close that gap. They are the same. We graduate students who, you know, come from um, journalism schools without understanding the realities of the newsroom. They have been, you know, trained um, uh, with uh, inadequate resources. The cameras are not enough. The student numbers are more than the resources that are there. So we learn quite a lot. But because we have to also to join um, you know, the ongoing changes and, and the digitalization, we also try to pick one of a few things and add it in our curriculum. Um, we teach a, a course which is called multimedia production, where we bring some small aspects of uh, digital journalism, but also data journalism. And um, to answer the question of the most previous um, uh, um, presenter, is that we, we, we may not all be at the same front of teaching data journalism, for example, but we realize the need of having journalists with some aspects of these skills because they need to work with databases. If they are reporting uh, population growth, if they are reporting economic issues that are underpinning most of the, the continent, most of the countries in the continent, they have to bring on board aspects of uh, data journalism. So we choose not to go overboard, but at least to bring some uh, aspects um, of uh, digital journalism. Digital journalism is uh, 
kind of easy because they already, if they already know radio production, then that um, turns into a podcast and then uh, the, the TV production, then that, that is, enables them to open a YouTube account so that they process uh, the content and find ways of putting it online. So we do that, but I think um, what we need to do right now is to see that our students or even the, the journalists of tomorrow that we produce, the content they produce is different from another person who has not done journalism. Like for example, if everybody is able to use a cell phone to produce news for television, how does a short, for example, differ from a short which is taken by a professional and a short which is taken by anybody who has never gone through journalism school. So we need to give them the practical aspects that are based on professionalism. Um, then I also think that we need to emphasize amongst our students issues of uh, media and information literacy so that you know, they learn how to uh, navigate through what is um, online, through what is there outside, even from the sources of information, what they are saying, what they may have gotten from the news media and whether it makes sense and whether it is credible and also be able to tell from um, fake news and uh, a real news which is based on uh, the right sources of information. Um, yeah. Another thing that I think that we are all confronted with is that when you look at the content, the journalism content which is coming out now, particularly from the writing aspect, it does not have any kind of depth. So the, the journalists, they go there, they quickly report, and I think this is also attributed to the urgency of the need to put out their information. So the, the stories are not deeply investigated. They are not well researched. And when they write the stories, sometimes even that balance that we tend to emphasize does not come out so well. So the content, particularly the content that comes out in the print media needs to, you know, needs to improve. Um, when you teach, um, like for example, um, one of my colleagues back in Rwanda was telling me that my, my students have uh, developed a very good magazine. The color is so fantastic. But when I read the content, I wonder, you know, the paper looks so beautiful, but the content, the content is not balanced. The content does not have like the credible sources of information. The sources are not balanced. And you see, when you read and go deep into analyzing that story, there's pretty much nothing, nothing to read. So I think as media educators, we really need to do that um, so that at least um, the journalism of tomorrow um, is the journalism that we, we were so much proud of, uh, particularly some 10 years back. Thank you very much. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I gave myself the, the microphone. No, thank you very much, um, as you should. Yes, John. Thank you so much. Just put on your mic. Yeah, yes, discussants and the other members who have actually responded to the discussions. Now, there has been a question hovering for some good time in this sector of journalism on whether journalism is going to die any time. <laughs> and so we've lived under fear because of uh, such a concern. And journalism has not actually died and is not about to die. I think what we need to do or what has been done in the newsrooms elsewhere to make sure that journalism actually survives is that people, the, the, the managers and the journalists in the newsrooms have realized that you can actually compete favorably with uh, the citizen journalists in, by doing this. You can break the story. And when you break the story uh, on your website, then you can do a follow-up in the newsroom uh, which the citizen journalists cannot actually do. You reach out to uh, uh, prominent and non-prominent sources outside there, 
and so you can build a strong story which the others cannot do and run online easily because one they lack resources but also they lack contacts as well so at the end of that day you have something that is tangible the challenge with that practice is that not so many uh, newsrooms can afford to fund quality journalism and also there's a problem of of uh, 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 story count in the newsrooms journalists are required to meet a certain story count uh, for example, uh, in the new vision which I worked for, Uganda's uh, main uh, daily newspaper, we are required to produce uh, 30 online uh, uh, stories and uh, 20 print stories. Now, that is a lot of content for one journalist to produce at the end of that day. Over in, what period of time? Uh, in, in a month. In one month. So that's 50. That's 50. That was a requirement. And that's a lot of work for journalists to do. And you know what has happened as a result of this pressure that is being put against journalists is that many of the experienced journalists have actually been automatically forced out of the newsrooms to go and do other kinds of, of, of work. For example, public relations or to work as communication experts. And the newsroom is now being, uh, uh, the people working in the newsrooms as journalists are uh, fresh graduates and people without qualifications. In my country, that is the experience. But this type of, this model of, of, of journalism where you produce, you run what is actually, uh, you run, you break the news and later do a follow-up. I made it uh, in, 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 in Norway at NLA University where uh, Ziza comes from. I discovered that, that this model works, but it can work well in Norway because they have resources. So they can be able to do a follow-up that is actually very serious. But I also wanted to give you a, a, a picture of what we are doing at Uganda Christian University related to what the two ladies have actually presented. How do we produce quality journalists in a way? And we are a school of, a department, a school of just 20 years in making. But we've been able to compete favorably with other universities which have actually been which, which have been around for over 100 years in the country. And this is seen by the number of journalists that we send in the newsrooms uh, on an annual basis. Uh, one of the things we did was to create a, a newsroom, a print newsroom. Uh, and we are running a newspaper that comes out twice in a year, twice in a month. Uh, uh, we, would, uh, we would employ, it was a model, we would employ uh, four graduating students every year for two years, and they would come and produce a newspaper with somebody working as a supervisor picked from uh, the, one of the uh, newsrooms in the country, well experienced. The person would be uh, interviewed by uh, experts within the university and from the media to work as the supervisor of this newspaper. The newspaper has got the standard. Now we suffered a big blow as a result of COVID-19. We ended up running out of resources. And when we ran out of resources, then the project collapsed because of COVID. So now we've decided to go online. So we are running an online uh, newspaper, still called the standard newspaper. And we've been partly responsible for sending a big number of uh, sub editors and writers to uh, the government newspaper, which is actually called the New Vision, which is actually the best employer in journalism in the country. Uh, we've also been able to survive still as a, as, as a school uh, because we've done partnerships. They have mentioned about partnerships. We are lucky to partner with um, NLO University and uh, in Norway and others, and the University of Rwanda and others. And we got funds to be able to to buy equipment, so we bought equipment. And so our students now are running another TV channel, uh, which is also online, and that has equipped them. They're doing marketing for our program. And so by doing such things, we've been able to survive in a way. But these uh, achievements call for uh, a lot of thinking and rethinking strategy, uh, but also, and, and rethinking strategy, but also, as I said, resources and partnerships to be able to do so. But as I said from the beginning, journalism is not about to die. It's not going to die. Uh, what we need to do is to try and change and organize ourselves. As long as we can be able to produce something that is quality in the newsroom, then there's no way we can die. Because the citizen journalist cannot be able to do what is done in the newsroom. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much. <clears throat> I also just want to uh, so that if anybody online wants to come in, I hope I will see hands if um, if they're put up. Um, you'd be most welcome to to pitch in. Um, 
Thanks for that. I mean, you, so many points have been raised. And of course, in the session uh, later this morning, we will be talking about some of these issues that arise out of, out of um, uh, all of us, I think, want to give students the opportunity to learn by doing, right? And that raises a whole bunch of issues, issues of resourcing. I was, um, I was keen to perhaps at some point hear a bit more from, from Sumpiwe about what it is to operate as a publisher in quite a difficult political environment. Because right? as you say, you, know, you come up against those limitations uh, that you have to navigate and your own administration may not be very happy with what you're doing. Issues of quality. We easily put out, use the word quality, right? And I was asking myself, well, what is it that we mean? Is it just a question of smooth audio or video editing? Or is it, um, I mean, Margaret was talking about um, the sourcing and the, the depth, I think, was the terms that, we, that she used. And of course, that's, um, you know, that's an important issue. Um, and, you know, you were talking about the newsrooms that people go into, where there's this enormous pressure to produce. 50 stories a month, that's two a day. That's a lot of, lot of volume that needs to get put out. And I think we need to think a little, a little bit more carefully about um, what it is that we're sending people into, the environment and the kinds of skills that they require. Um, uh, before I you know, open, ask for, for more contributions, I see Nancy's light is on. Um, I just want to say that I've, I'm told that we are expecting what's called, what South Africa is called load shedding in 10 minutes. Those of you from outside may know it under a different name. It means the power goes off um, on a scheduled basis, and we're expecting it at 10 o'clock. It doesn't always happen exactly at the, at the right time. Not that there's any, any, that there's ever a right time. Um, uh, it, we, there is backup power but it may take three or four minutes to come back on. Um, so I just also do want to say to those people online, if we disappear at 10 or thereabouts, uh, don't lose faith. We will be back as soon as the backup power returns. Um, and of course, our keynote uh, will be coming to us from Glasgow, um, and that may be a, a bit of a disruption. So just a heads up on that. Uh, we'll navigate that as best we can. Um, Nancy, let me hand over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. I wanted an opportunity to re reply because uh, uh, Margaret mentioned our school. And I think while the impression out there is that we seem to be doing everything right, you know, as the, as the two <laughs> presenters were speaking, you know, I could relate with a lot of the um, experiences that they shared with us because, uh, you know, they sit very well with what we're going through at the Graduate School of Media and Communications. I think just a bit of background is that, you know, when we were set up, uh, we were coming from the uh, backdrop that, uh, you know, Kenya has uh, at that particular time had over 66 universities offering one form of journalism training or another. So it was either at the diploma level or at the undergraduate level. Uh, but even with that, uh, you know, um, extent of, uh, you know, universities offering one form of journalism education or another, um, you know, the industry was still saying, uh, raising concerns about the quality of journalism. And so, uh, you know, we ran a, a graduate school that brings together, uh, you know, both people from the academy, but also, you know, what we call professors of practice, uh, you know, uh, seasoned editors and newsroom managers, as well as journalists who teach in the program or contribute uh, to the program in one way or another. Um, and then our students, uh, you know, um, for now, it's a requirement that by the time you're enrolling into the program that you submit a portfolio of work and that you have at least two years minimum experience. And when we started, we had certain assumptions, you know, that we would not be dwelling on the basics, we would not be dwelling on, um, you know, principles of journalism, that they would know, you know, the ethics of journalism. But I think we're increasingly inundated with, um, you know, concerns even about the quality of journalism, you know, reporting that comes out of, uh, you know, students who are in our program. Uh, you know, I sit in the Media Complaints Commission in Kenya, 
And, you know, sometimes I'm embarrassed to say that uh, in a few instances, some of the complaints that have come before the commission that touch on accuracy and ethics. And I think when you spoke about ethics, I, I you know, I, I, I agreed with you that, um, you know, some of those are our students, some of them are, you know, seasoned journalists and, uh, you know, the, the complaints are basically around, you know, the ethics of reporting. So whereas, you know, it's a good story, it has great graphics, it has good color, it has been told in multiple platforms, you know, if it raises questions about, you know, ethical questions around accuracy and the credibility of reporting, you know, then I guess our work is still cut out uh, for us. Um, and, you know, interestingly over the years is that, you know, when media houses in Kenya recruit, uh, and I'm, I'm talking about the big names, the Nation Media Group and the Standard Media, uh, the Standard Group, that every time they recruit a new batch of journalists, they come to us and we run a six month training, you know, for all their recruits before they can actually get onto, uh, you know, uh, the newsroom. And, um, uh, you know, the challenge is that in as much as, you know, everybody seems to be trading in journalism, there is one, there is no consistency uh, in the quality of training. Um, there's no consistency or, you know, certain, uh, uh, you know, um, outcomes that seem to cut across the board. So even when we get the recruits who come from different institutions, you know, there's just such a different level of training. And at some point, just finding that, you know, sweet spot where you begin to bring everybody on board is, is quite a, a, a challenge. One of the things that has helped us, particularly in running the graduate programs, is that, you know, over the last four years, we've had the advantage of funding that helps us uh, give scholarships to our students. And so uh, we are able to invest in equipment, invest in technology, invest in, you know, the sort of resources that we need from a, you know, human resource point of view, you know, and, and that just speaks to the realities that, you know, when you're thinking about quality journalism, it's also how do you resource the training? How do you resource that education? And, and how do you also reimagine, you know, that journalism classroom you know, if you want that to be uh, the sort of thing that you see in a newsroom. And, and it presents a huge challenge because beyond just the teaching, that you also have to think about how do you fund the programs that you're running and where do you get that funding? How do you get the partners uh, who, who are interested and who are passionate and who are willing to invest in, you know, in that quality journalism? So, uh, you know, as a journalism trainer, it's not just about what I do in the classroom, it's also how do I, you know, when you you know you're dealing with the university management that you know looks at how much you're asking for to run a journalism program vis-a-vis uh, -vis, you know what the medical college runs and i choose that intentionally because the Gakan university has for a long time had a tradition in medical education training and as a new kid on the block, as a graduate school of media and communications, you know, it, it takes a lot to just convince management that they need to invest, you know, um, as well as they are in medical training, uh, you know, because of the, you know, why, why journalism is, um, is important. So you're always having to deal with those um, challenges as you try and, and resource uh, what you do. Um, and also realizing that, um, uh, you know, the political realities in, in the African countries are not the same, and yet our students come from the larger East African, you know, community, uh, so you cannot assume that, you know, the political realities in Kenya, you know, are also the realities in Tanzania and uh, in Uganda or in Rwanda, and, uh, and not just, you know, within the country, but also when different governments, you know, take over, uh, you know, what are those realities? Um, we are inaugurating a new president today in Kenya, and, you know, there's a lot of concern about, you know, what that will do for media freedom, you know, so those are the realities that um, we'd have to contend with. And I think as the two ladies were presenting, I think one of the questions that I wrote down is, um, 
in as much as we're talking about the African newsroom, uh, you know, do we do we even understand what that is, and is it similar across the board, um, you know, or is it not? Um, and and what are those realities that then we have to think about or the critical issues within the African space, some which might be cross cutting, but others that are very, very different. And that point to the realities around, you know, how we then approach journalism uh, training across the continent. Well, <clears throat> thanks for that. <clears throat> and I think it very neatly takes us into a, an important and central question. And it is exactly that. What is the same and what is different? Um, and clearly, it's just, I mean, partly the, the, this initiative to, to bring us together in this forum is born of a sense that we, you know, we, there are these narratives about global journalism, which are just kind of thrust on, on our realities, and they just don't apply very often. Um, and of course, as you say, within the continent, I mean, newsrooms differ vastly, whether you're in Eswatini or in Johannesburg, if you're in, 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 in Zambia or, or wherever else, um, they really differ vastly. And I think we need to, to do more, I think, ourselves to understand what the commonalities are and what the differences are. Um, it's 10 o'clock, so um, I'm going to bring this session to a close with a Really warm thanks to the two of you. Um, I mean, we'll obviously continue the discussion as the day goes on, both formally and informally, but I think you've given us a great um, grounding and, and, and start. Um, we, um, there's two things that we need to be mindful of. The one is, as I said, load shedding. So I kind of sit here on the edge of my seat waiting for the lights to go <laughs> off. <laughs> it's a familiar experience to those of us. <laughs> um, but well, as I said earlier, we'll navigate it as we as we go. Um, apparently at 10, but as yeah, it's not always exactly at 10. Um, 